thank you for coming in. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I wanted to take the time to talk to you about anything at all you'd like to talk about. I know there's a couple of things that are on our minds right now. And I don't know how much more I can add to the conversation, but I think it's important that you hear it from me personally about how we take uh, and how we are uh, engaging the situation. And if I leave you with no other thought, it's simply this. Um, I, myself, and on behalf of the DSG and the Chief of Staff and Forest Boss and everyone else, recognize that the unfolding events are a significant impact to you and weigh on you. And they weigh on all of us. And I won't begin to pretend that if I were to tell you, I feel your pain, the same pain you're feeling, your immediate thought is, well, that's great, pal, except you may not lose 20% of your pay. OK? So I say that right off, is that I recognize this is a big deal. The time to stop sequestration has come and gone, but that doesn't mean there aren't efforts being made as we speak in Congress and between the executive branch to try to mitigate this. Now, I don't know if they're going to mitigate it or not. There's a spectrum, is there not, that goes from this end to this end. This end over here, a full 22 days of furlough between now and October, worst case scenario. This, end, this one over here, they somehow come to resolution and sequestration gets obviated, or at least the personnel impact gets obviated, or something in the middle where funds are transferred and they can, they can take less out of the personnel budget. Now, you all are as adept at this as I am, and you know that this was not a discretionary action upon the Department of Defense. The part of the complexity, and some would say the, the poorly thought out plan of sequestration was the way it creates draconian requirements to take the money out of every program across the DOD. And not every agency in the federal government gets taxed the same, because DOD is half of the sequestration budget cuts. And then the law stipulates you cannot take the money just out of a few areas and leave the rest behind. That's what the Navy and the Armed Forces wanted to do. They said, hey, look, can we just take most of it out of our R&D or our acquisition or our maintenance or our operating and maintenance? And the answer came back, no, you must take it as a salami slice across every budget, including about five billion bucks worth of your personnel budget. The only way DOD can do that is to take the maximum of 22 days by law of furlough. So some other agencies may not have 22 days. They may have 15, they may have 10. It depends on the number of civilians that work for them and the percentage of that civilian personnel footprint is for that agency, FDA, NIH, Child Protective Agency, certain law enforcement agencies. So that's where we are right now. I bring that up. I go, I go through that discussion of why these automatic cuts were put in place. And I think everybody agrees. I haven't heard anybody who's willing to publicly stand up and say sequestration is a good idea. Because as you know, over a year ago, the lawmakers got together and they said, let's, des let's design a scenario that is so impractical and is so painful that the super committee, which was charged to get together and put the budget together, will have to come to some sort of resolution. They'll have to come to some sort of compromise on tax increases and budget cuts and spending. They'll have to because the, the alternative, the sequestration, and the way the law says you have to take it across the budget programs is so cumbersome, so painful, and so potentially devastating to certain segments of the population and potentially to the national defense, they'll never allow that to happen. And it happened. And so the reason I bring this up 
is because I want to make sure that nobody takes it personally. And that's sometimes easy to say and hard to do. As I told the group before, there's a scene I remember from the movie in the book called Moneyball, where um, a baseball manager uh, does some really innovative things. And at the end, he, they want to hire him away to another team. And the, and the other team offers him a ton of money. And uh, he's talking to his buddy. And he says, I don't want to go. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't need the money. Money doesn't matter to me. And his friend says, it's not the money. It's what the money says. It's the fact that the money is saying you're worth this. And so I worry that some people might think, is this, are they impugning my worth to the organization? Do they, do they relegate us as this part of the workforce, as something that can take this hit? Is this, are we an afterthought? They talk in this organization about people being our most important asset. The SG, the Surgeon General, has gone on record saying the civilian workforce in Navy medicine is the bedrock of our organization. You are the corporate continuity, let alone your expertise in various areas that each of you have. And I've engaged in those conversations with you, and I'm always humbled and awestruck by them. When I ask you a question about this policy and you start quoting, well, TAC Bravo 46.6 means this and this and this, and I go, I have no idea what you're talking about. Thank God you're here. So we say all that, and at the same time, all of a sudden, you get this hit to you that says we're going to partition your workday, and we're going to have you not come to work. And are you expendable? Are you an afterthought? Is this something that we can simply do without and toy with because you're not that critical to the organization. And that's the pain of all this because it's exactly the opposite. You are the corporate continuity. You are the collective conscience of this organization here at BUMED and throughout Navy Medicine. Guys like me come and go. For those of you in the audience right now who aren't wild about me or my style, the good news for you is I go some point. Some point. But you don't. You stay. You hold down the fort. You're critical. You're critical to the organization. And yes, as we speak here at BUMED, and as this goes out on the airwaves to those people in the, in the far corners of Navy medicine, I recognize that sometimes the bureaucracy can be cumbersome, the regulatory requirements, the, the new sort of fashionable way to do things. Everybody run to the left. Everybody run to the right. But at the end of the day, we're all about one thing. You and me are all about one thing. We're all about putting the absolute best, most capable, most professional, most equipped, and most knowledgeable individuals into some very dangerous and treacherous places and making sure they have everything they need. Because as you know, the reason we exist is not necessarily to run a hospital. We do that because that's part of the gears that allows us to provide force provision. But the reason we exist is because we have men and women right now out at sea, deployed overseas, in the war zone, whose knowledge, effort, training, experience, equipment, all somehow comes back to a starting point which emanates in many cases, from our civilian workforce. And it's a serious business. And I don't diminish Walmart or IBM or an auto parts place. Everybody has an important role in what they do in society. But ours is a little different because every once in a while, our shipmates that work with us, work with you and me, don't come home or they come home mangled. And our job, our job is to be able to look their loved ones in the eye and say they had everything they needed. We gave them the best fighting chance to make the most difference. And we need to be able to look the eye, into the eye of the families of the warriors 
and those who are deploying alongside of them and say, we've given your loved ones the absolute best chance of fighting illness, of fighting injury, of recovering from wounds because of the people we've trained, we've put together, we've supplied, we have sourced into that area. So although I have strong affection for, the, for our naval hospitals, I've worked at many of them and led some, they're not the main reason that we exist. They are necessary to our existence. This is where I hope people forget to put the mute button on. <laughs> and they start saying, yeah, yeah, company guy. I've heard it all before. He's a loser. I worked for him in Pensacola. He hasn't changed for a minute. And then I say, yeah, that's fine. I love that kind of feedback. And Daryl, go get him. <laughs> anyway, my point is, is that we're in a pretty serious business. We really are. And we've sort of had a say-do gap here. Because I continually tell you, the Chief of Naval Operations continually tells you, the Secretary of the Navy continually tells you how important you are to the mix and how we can't do our job without you. And then you get hit with this, which says, you know what? Well, to make some money up, we're going to have to cut your pay and, put you, and furlough you. So I wanted you to understand. I wanted you to hopefully make sure that any of those of you, and hopefully not many, but you're not taking it personally that you're not taking it as a sign that it's a question of your value or a question of your worth to the organization. I recognize that each and every day, many of you go home on the shuttle or on your cars or wherever, and you say they have no idea today what I did for them. They have no idea this organization, I went beyond my position description. I went outside my lane. I took care of this. I stayed longer than I had to. And I've told you before, I do get that. I do understand that. That's why I stay in this organization. Contrary to popular belief, I could have found a job somewhere else a while ago. <laughs> but I've stayed here to work with you because I enjoy being surrounded by your ethos, by your dedication by the difference you want to make to an organization that's bigger than ourselves, that supports the national defense, that supports the national security, that supports that young sailor or marine that's scared out of their wits somewhere overseas or on a ship or in the war or in Gitmo or in Djibouti, who just thinks at least if something happens to me, Navy medicine is there to take care of me. We can't afford to ever have that change. And you're an integral part of that. So I want you to hear that from me personally. If nothing else, I wanted to ask you to come together today and take some time to hear that from me personally, how much we value and think of you, and how frustrating it is for us to see these kinds of programs sort of whip us around. And I hope that there'll be more talks and more efforts. And please realize you're not alone. Please realize the rest of the Navy is sort of coming to a, much of it is coming to a halt. This was a last resort. This was not let's throw people's pay and time in first. This was the last resort. And I don't know how many of you saw the cover of Navy Times. Admiral Greener, the CNO. His story was basically, look, we can't continue to do more with less because at some point we run into a safety issue. So let's take care of all those critical missions and put our resources to those so that those will not fail, and they won't. But let's not push ourselves to the point of we're unsafe because we don't have the people on deck, we don't have the equipment on deck, we don't have the training on deck to guarantee its safety. So our leaders are standing up and going on the record that this is bad stuff. This is not the best way to meet the mission readiness. And I think everybody knows that. I think everybody knows that. What's going to be done about it, I don't know. So I wanted to talk about that. And I wanted you to hear that. And I wanted to tell you that, again, 
until we know for sure that this is a done deal, and it's, we're planning along that way, but I'm hoping that there'll be some sort of reprieve. Just don't know. And it would mostly take effect between, for many of you, the mid part to the latter part of April to capture 22 days of savings before October. Exceptions, exemptions, few. Even many of the civil uh, fire departments and police departments will not get exemptions. Uh, certain areas in the Navy may. One of them is medical for provision of care. And it'll be local. It'll, be, it'll vary on locality. And if one place has most of their ICU staffed by military, okay. But if they, another place has most of their ICU staffed by civilians, there may be some exemptions made. But we haven't seen the footprint yet. We've been asked to draw up our plan for that. But we haven't seen the footprint yet. So that's mostly what I wanted to say. I wanted to just tell you personally, eyeball to eyeball, how much we value and cherish what you bring to the game. And we recognize you could work other places, and you choose to work here. And ideally, you choose to work here because you recognize you're doing something that makes such a difference throughout the world. And their moms and dads and brothers and sisters and sons and daughters and wives and husbands counting on us to continue to make that difference. So I didn't want you to take it personally. I want you to understand it's a last resort. I want you to understand that DOD having the gravitas half of the sequestration costs and the fact that the law regulates that it must be taken across all the programs across the DOD, this is why we're in this boat. And I want to say on behalf of the leadership, and especially the uniform leadership, we're frustrated by this, your shipmates, and I get the fact that it's a little different because at the present time, my pay's not impacted, but yours is. And I appreciate that, and I understand that. But I wanted you to understand how much I and the senior leadership of Navy and DOD are doing everything we can to make people aware that this is the wrong way to do business. Again, I apologize for the fact that you have to suffer this possible sequestration to your hours and to your pay. And I'm hoping that there'll be a reprieve of some kind. If there isn't, I thank you for continuing to weather the challenges of the bureaucracy and keeping the goal in mind. There's a young kid out there right now somewhere who's either half dead from illness or injury or suffering, who isn't really worried about me or you, just worried about getting a return to life. They probably will because of what we do, because of what you do. Please don't forget that.